Dr. Roach's idea today was like, hey, maybe we should have a combined talk, because I know usually we just have one doctor talking, and I do think it's a great idea when there's a disease process where you probably want both views, um, as long as you understand medicine is the right view all the time, okay? <laughs> but ultimately, really, is it, do we do try something medical or do we use something surgically, okay? And I don't know if you guys can read, it says, do not amputate on both arms because it's a gallbladder surgery, but I thought it was funny. So what exactly is a gallbladder mucus seal? So accumulation of thick, immobile, rubbery mucus within the gallbladder. So the contents <coughs> eventually will obstruct bile flow or rupture into the abdomen. And you'll see there's many different uh, types of gallbladder mucus seals, but it all depends on the stage of the maturity, you know. And the ones that are really, really impressive, you know, when you literally can peel the uh, gallbladder wall away. I've seen green, black, and then sometimes they'll be very pale. Um, but either case, a lot of times they're, they're pretty rubbery and, and impressive. When you do submit these, uh, the histopathologically, uh, really, there is uh, a very little inflammation, um, but they can have inflammation in the wall itself. A lot of times it's related to with the bacterial infections and such, um, or there's a lot of necrosis that's happening. And they've identified some cases where maybe we're seeing an in increased incidence of gallbladder arterial thrombosis. Uh, that may maybe be a secondary issue because a lot of times they're hypercoagulable, you know, when you have a, a, a crisis situation in particular. The thought process is, you know, there is definitely excessive secretion of this gel-forming mucins, and if it has very abnormal properties. And, and it's really by done like the entire gallbladder epithelium, but we really don't know the cause. People have tried to study this stuff, and it really doesn't have a lot of bile acids in it. It's definitely not the right content compared to regular bile. And on biopsy, or I'm sorry, on histopath, you'll see a description of cystic mucinous hyperplasia is frequently seen. They don't feel that cholecystitis is part of the inciting factor. There's plenty of them, that, again, that don't have inflammation at all. We don't know that cystic mucinous hyperplasia, it's not a necessary a cause or effect. We really just don't know. It's probably some kind of multifactorial issue. Biliary, biliary uh, mucosils as a clinical diagnosis was not really reported until the mid-90s. So it's kind of interesting because, like, what's the thought process of that? And some people thought, well, everyone's, you know, doing more ultrasounds. Before, it was very difficult to get an ultrasound, unless only at universities. But at the same time, necropsies were done all the time, and people doing surgeries and such. So I still feel like there's probably not just a simple answer. We're detecting them more because we're doing more ultrasounds. Um, but uh, there may be something else uh, related. Talk about gallbladder dyskinesis, especially with hypothyroid dogs. Maybe there's some component to that. But again, a not very uh, simple, straightforward. Because not um, all cases of gallbladder mucosal have the exact same pattern. I mean, they look the same as in the uh, histopath and the actual mucosal itself, but we really don't know why. So which animal is likely to get a gallbladder mucosal? And really, the answer is all of these, you know, any of these usually small to medium-sized dogs. But we do have a, um, a higher prevalence in certain breeds. So we do know that it tends to be older dogs, mean is 9 to 10 years old. Mostly they're small to medium, but we have reported large breeds that can get this also. No sex predilection. And it, often it's associated with hypothyroid and Cushing's disease, but that's not necessarily the cause, okay? It may uh, make things worse in the formation, but, but we see so many dogs with Cushing's and hypothyroid don't form mucosils. And there's definitely a strong predisposition. So the Shetland sheepdogs, uh, maybe they, they often will be uh, the primary hypercholesterolemic dogs, and they're not hypothyroid, actually. They have uh, seen a gene in particular for the Shetland, that's the ABCBG4 uh, gene, and it's supposed to be a phospholipid translator, um, a translocator expressed on the hepatocytes and the caninicular membranes. So, you know, they do a lot of study, at least particularly on the Shetland sheepdogs, because they are so unique and they're overrepresented. Uh, but we do see Cocker Spaniels, Pomeranians, Schnauzers, and maybe the key thing is the hyperlipidemic ones, you know, because we definitely have that population that are hyperlipidemic, then maybe those are the ones that are predisposed to mucosils, diabetes, pancreatitis, and so on. And then Chihuahuas are a little bit higher too, but really it's less common in the mixed breed, but I would never use this type of description to rule out a gallbladder mucosil. And there doesn't seem to be a seasonal or regional variation. Uh, in this disease process. Gallbladder mucosils and endocrinopathies, there, there's been some pretty large studies when they look at 
endocrinopathies and then what are the chances of this dog having uh, gallbladder mucus still. So they look at these guys and uh, they do feel that maybe there is a, that the, with hypothyroid, they're three times more likely to be diagnosed with hypothyroid when you have a mucus seal dog compared to a dog that doesn't have mucus seal. And adrenal, hyperadrenal cortisism, they are 29 times more likely to be diagnosed with Cushing's compared to a dog without. And, and they, they tend to have higher post-ACTH cortisol levels alone, and they need a higher doses of trilostane. And what's interesting is people have tried to say, well, maybe there's Cushing's. What happens if you give a dog with tons and tons of steroids? Is that going to cause a dog to have mucus seal? It doesn't seem to be the direct link, okay? Because there's a lot of like IMHAs that are on high-dose steroids. Do we see a higher prevalence of mucus seals in them? Not necessarily. So what are the clinical signs? They can really vary from asymptomatic to really nonspecific GI distress. That could be literally vomiting, episodic vomiting, um, like that chihuahua we saw today, um, to episodic soft feces, to um, really just cramping, decreased appetite, but then it resolves. And that's why a lot of people don't necessarily go to the vet because it, a lot of times they don't really make that link. I always try to tell my clients that if you have gallbladder disease, a lot of people have gallbladder disease, so they kind of know when I ask, like, you know, if you know anybody in the family that has gallbladder issues or gallstones, you'll often frequently have indigestion, decreased appetite periodically, nausea, and they'll usually um, uh, kind of get the idea of gallbladder disease as very nonspecific sometimes. And eventually, over time, it could be progressive cholestasis, and then eventually, at the worst case scenario, is acute bile pancreatitis. The most common signs are vomiting, anorexia, lethargy, abdominal pain, ictus, and fever. However, these signs are relatively uh, vague in certain ways because we've seen that a lot with pancreatitis and acute gastroenteritis, which is much more common than just gallbladder mucus seals. And cholelithiasis looks exactly the same. Biliary parasites, pancreatic or biliary neoplasias when it starts blocking the duct. And uh, you can have cholecystitis, inflammatory liver diseases, and then bile duct strictures. Frequently, we do have gallbladder mucus seals and pancreatitis, you know, especially when you're already kind of full, and maybe the pancreas just got swollen enough, and now it's really blocking, and then they really blow up. When we look at blood work, it's not always necessarily uh, easy to predict the severity of disease and the outcome of the disease. When you see that there's inflammatory leukogram, it's about 50%. You know, anemia, it's mild. It's probably a chronic issue, so you get anemia of chronic disease. Elevations of liver enzymes, again, today our case has completely perfect blood work. Keep in mind, sometimes if you have gallbladder mucus seals, eventually it does back up into the intrahepatic ducts, so then you can have secondary liver disease also. About 50% of gallbladder mucus seals will have concurrent liver disease, but we don't know they can have separate primary liver disease, and then you can have ones because it's due to the mucus seal, so it's hard to differentiate. And then elevation, I think it's interesting to note that's like only about 50 to 83 percent of dogs have high bilirubin, you know, uh, despite what the gallbladder looks like. Many dogs with gallbladder ruptures do not have hyperlipidemia, uh, uh, bilirubinemia. And I think it's because it is so rubbery, there's not much to kind of really suck back into the vessels uh, when it's in the abdomen. So I think that's really tricky too. A lot of times they have, you know, azotemia, that's going to be probably pre-renal. And then frequently they have high triglycerides and cholesterol, but again, it's probably maybe the animals that are predisposed to getting this may have this problem. You often will see elevated lactate, and some people have noticed that if you have a ruptured gallbladder um, mucus seal, maybe they have a higher lactate level. Maybe it's a negative prognostic indicator in post-operatively, or lactate goes up, and that goes with any kind of critical care, you know, sepsis, you know, all sorts of stuff. So lactate is sometimes used, but. Um, I think that radiographs are not always very helpful. I think uh, this uh, radiograph I just showed you earlier with a big like mass, like it was all gallbladder. And that, that's pretty rare, I feel. Uh, most of the time, I don't think it's always helpful, but occasionally you will have the mass effect in the right cranial abdomen. And really, the key to diagnosis of a mucosal formation is by abdominal ultrasound. And it's in large gallbladder with immobile, non-gravity dependent contents. So I call it organized, that's what I was taught. And with finely striated or stalite um, pattern. Um, and it, but it really can vary in appearance. They have noted that maybe the gallbladder wall thickness really can be variable. I mean, when you see surgically, some of the wall is really thin, and, but then yet it's full of um, this thick uh, material. 
And since the tibia ultrasound, really, I should write anywhere from the most recent paper is 56% to, to maybe 85 in an older paper. But the main thing is that it's really important to know that there's, it's very hard to tell you your animal has a ruptured gallbladder just purely on ultrasound, you know, because with 56%, that's kind of uh, not very high. Just to kind of refresh uh, the anatomy, and I know Dr. Roach will probably do a much better job because I don't know what really looks like inside there. But my understanding is that um, there you have the gallbladder, and then you have a cystic duct. You know, you have a gallbladder neck, and it goes down to the cystic duct, and then eventually it'll, it'll go to the common bile duct. And then there's other hepatic biliary ducts that are going in, and then you have the little pancreatic duct that is um, going into the duodenum also. So what's interesting about that is long time ago when this kind of started coming out, I think it was like 2000 when we started really talking about it, um, a lot of people thought it was a purely an obstruction <coughs> of the um, bile flow, and then maybe then it kind of builds everything up, and that's why it gets sludgier and sludgier. But just like, you know, when I'm starting thinking about that, it's like just like a case like today. Gallbladder is totally abnormal, but the bilirubin and elk FOS, ALT, completely normal. There's no cholestasis at all, at least based on blood work. Then I, and I'm thinking if your liver is still making bile, it still has to kind of travel through these like hepatic ducts, and it must be patent, you know? But then this thing is totally solid on ultrasound. So I wonder, it's, it's not here, but maybe it starts out here and then it gets so full, and then it, once it gets so, so full, then, then you start having problems. The main thing is that People have tried to tie these up um, in beagles, like research beagles, and, um, and try to create more sludge, and it doesn't work. So, so it's not a, even like um, that type of study, it didn't suggest that it was going to form a mucosil. When people start to identify more about <coughs> mucosils, there was an old paper that really talked about this is a, the proposed mechanism. Maybe it starts with bile, and then becomes a little bit sludgy, then it kind of transforms into these kind of different variations. I think that is something that was just like a guess because we've seen so many different variations of what gallbladder mucosils look like on ultrasound. So I think that's really hard to tell you that um, this is the system because we've now we have so much data, so many images of gallbladder mucosil. If you guys are VIN members and you just literally just type in gallbladder mucosil images, like there'd be like whole loops of like tons of ultrasound images of gallbladder mucosil. And if you think about it, it makes sense because uh, it's just like there's a quite a variation. And these are all pretty mature, you know, but you do wonder, it didn't happen overnight. So I do feel like there's probably some kind of gradation and we don't know the rate of progression. And that's kind of the missing piece of the information. It's like, when does it get to this? And like this dog today, no one's going to work that up at all. You know, why would you even do an ultrasound on a healthy dog? It's with, with, with episodic vomiting, with, you know, that responds to ID. I do find it also interesting on the, um, in that particular study when they start to kind of look at gallbladders on ultrasound, trying to describe it more. It was a 14 dog study, so it's not really big, but it was interesting that, that they found that the cystic and common bile ducts were normal in size in five of the dogs, in, in five dogs, and then at surgery they were completely obstructed you know, in at necropsy. So I do feel like the sensitivity to tell if the gallbladder is truly, you know, the bile duct is dilated or not dilated, I just don't know it's going to help me to say, because uh, you could be fully obstructed and still look normal, you know. And half the time, I, I honestly, I can't even find the gallbladder uh, bile ducts. Uh, sometimes um, in cats, it's super easy. They get the tortuous old cat uh, bile ducts. That's probably incidental. But I do find that it, it can be challenging. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. The one in the lower left corner. Yes. Is that proved out to be a mucosal? No, no, no. So I want to just kind of throw out some of these images that, that we see on a gallbladder mucosal from very different studies. And it's interesting because I wanted to specifically put in, you know, we see tons of this kind of sludge, and then we consider that gravity dependent. That's going to be nothing. And then, then you have these like little speckles of stuff. I mean, that's still not a mucosal. Is that going to turn into a mucosal? We see a lot of these cases that kind of look like this as they get older. As you can see, the organization of these patterns is, is really classic, right? Then what about this one? I mean, what would you say? This was in a paper that was a schnauzer that, uh, I think it was like a 14-year-old single case report schnauzer that um, uh, had the same presentations of a uh, gallbladder mucosal. And, but they followed it they, because they first said, hey, this, the, the ultrasound offer didn't even mention this as a mucosal, which 
it didn't come out as a mucus on at least on classically on ultrasound. But now the dog was managed medically, you know, just like a little bit of ursodiol, a little bit of antibiotics, and anti-nauseous medication, famotidine or so, and ultimately had um, sent the dog home and then start to not feel good again with acute cramping, vomiting, and such. Three months later, uh, they felt like they thought this progressed. I, I cannot tell the progression. I'm not able to appreciate that. Um, but they ended up going to surgery. And at surgery, um, the gallbladder looked like a mucus seal. Okay? Histopathologically, it did not have the cystic hyperplasia. So by definition, it, it didn't have the cystic hyperplasia, but when they opened it up, it was uh, like a solid, chunky, very organized uh, mucus seal. So is that just a phase of it? I get bothered when I start to see little striations, you know, along the wall, personally. So. I don't know how we could classify um, this as a truly amica seal or not. Histologically, it didn't come back as a amica seal, but it acted sure like one. I mean, I, I, I lean toward getting it out, you know, because everything else was okay with this dog, and the dog did really well after that. So I do think there's going to be all these gray zones that I don't think we could really categorize, you know, either black or white type of thing. Now that a lot of people are doing ultrasounds and, and just, you know, the availability, accessibility of ultrasound, we are getting tons of dogs with sludge, and is that a mucus seal or not? And it is impressive that gallbladder sludge is often an incidental finding, um, and, and I have to agree. A lot of times I'm doing scans for Dr. Vansel or what have you, and then I would say a good, you know, 60% or so or more uh, have mucus seals, or not mucus seals, sludge, and it's not organized. Some are more chunky than others, and we do find that dogs with Cushing's and hypothyroid are more likely to have more severe sludge, but again, it doesn't get organized necessarily. The exogenous steroids, when they try to um, take uh, uh, dogs to kind of, give them uh, exogenous steroids for, for 84 months, um, they did not turn into more sludgy or, or increase. But again, is 84 months enough? I just don't know. But definitely, I just feel strongly that I think sludge and mucus seal organization, they're not the same. But I think there's probably some gray ones. And I thought it was a really good study, kind of cool, where they actually follow dogs that are out for a whole year uh, 42 dogs over a course of a year, and they just kind of watch for progression because uh, no one has really done that. This was at Virginia Tech. I thought it was worth mentioning because it was a prospective oper op op <laughs> observational study. And it was like 77 healthy dogs, and they screened for sludge, and 45 were affected. And then, um, then they try to classify what's mild, moderate, severe. And that's the other thing that every ultrasonographer may have different, you know, it's very subjective. And so they kind of did, they broke it down to 24% of the lumens filled, moderate is 47%, moderate to severe is around, you know, 49.5 to 74. So when I type my ultrasound reports, I usually do identify lumens filled by 50%, 40%, 30%, what have you. And then they uh, looked at it serially from three months, six months, nine months, and a year. And then they found that really uh, not a lot had, had changed. You know, there's no significant difference in median degree of sludge over the one year period. My concern, again, is, is uh, the population that truly eventually become mucus seals. Like, is that a three-year process, four-year process? You know, is year enough? I don't know, but I felt like just one year didn't do much, you know? She kind of bro uh, broke hers down a little bit to trying to give you what she considered mild, moderate, severe. That's just that picture, because this would be a more severe one. So again, this one, she's not calling a mucus seal because it's not that organization that you see. You know, we definitely have seen a few dogs like that, just incidentally. If I see something like that, though, I don't think it's ever wrong to do a low-fat diet, you know, because I do feel like they may have more gallbladder issues. Then, uh, then a subset with initial gravity-dependent sludge developed a combination of dependent and non-dependent. So there was a subset that started to get a little bit more solid, um, where it didn't move as well. And then it was interesting that even 2% of dogs had resolved, and some had decreased in the amount of sludge, and a lot of them became static and somebody increased, and then recurrent, as in like uh, it would go away, then come back again later. The key thing is that they thought biliary sludge is prevalent among uh, affected dogs who remain asymptomatic and rarely resolved in healthy dogs. And that's the key thing, and these are healthy dogs. But I do think anytime you're doing a study, it's like which one are the healthy ones that would do this? And if it's, if it's an animal that's diabetic, hypoadrenal cortisism, or um, hyperadrenal cortisism, or, or hypothyroid, maybe just a different population that you may have to look at.
Maybe they'll progress faster. I don't know. What other diagnostics can we do? So I like to um, uh, do pancreatitis, okay? And I'm sure the interns are laughing because I, I, everything gets pancreatitis in, in when I see them. Because I do think that it's closely, it's often associated with uh, gallbladder disease and, and elevated liver enzymes. I'm trying to peel out the, the two. Because if I have a dog that's 2,000, acute vomiting, very painful, and then I happen to find that there's a gallbladder that's kind of not full mature mucosal, but what do I do with that? If I ultrasound that exact same dog a month ago when it was asymptomatic and had the exact same gallbladder, you weren't going to be rushing to surgery. You'd be treating the pancreatitis when it's sick. But then now the question is, you know, which ones do we have to go to surgery? And if we know it's, we identify it's a disease, um, we don't want to ignore it either. But if it's something that's so severe with pancreatitis, I'd like to give it some time with food support because they're super dehydrated. I'm not going to necessarily rush to surgery immediately. Um, but at, again, that would be interesting to see what um, Dr. Roach um, thinks from a surgeon's perspective. And, and it also helps me too that it's a straightforward gallbladder mucosal and the pancreatitis is normal. Then when they recover, I actually just feed them like, you know, pretty quickly a full volume or, you know, reasonable, you know, for a, a dog that has no gallbladder. But I may not be as shy about it when you have a 2,000 PLI and you just got your gallbladder removed, you know. Those are the ones that I might be more conservative and how soon or how fast um, I feed them. And I don't recommend sticking a needle in the gallbladder. I know some people do, and they're probably braver than I am. I'm just always worried about the integrity of the gallbladder wall, and I don't know what I'm really getting out of it. You know, I, if I send it off for cytology, it's like it's very hard to sometimes to find bacteria, and, uh, and if it is, it could be embedded, you know, uh, that you're not going to necessarily get a diffuse bacteria, you know, uh, you know like, a, like, like urine, you know. It's like a fluid versus like a chunky um, material. And uh, in there's free fluid in the abdomen. You definitely want to you know, try to culture the free fluid. And then you want to do a fluid analysis. And I did find it interesting that a lot of these dogs don't have high bilirubin. So there was a cool study where the dog had rupture, and there was question, did they rupture or not, and they had free fluid. And they actually did bile, uh, bile acids. And I never thought, yeah, we could do bile acids. And, and it was like 10, like 10,000 was a bile acids, and the serum was like, you know, 30 or something crazy low. So very similar to our bilirubin stuff when we use it. But it's, uh, I thought it was kind of neat. So medical management, so obviously it's very controversial, you know, um, and because we just don't know, can you reverse that? I mean, if you look at that slime, that sludge, people have tried to inject things in the gallbladder in the past, they've done different drugs. I just don't think you could reverse something that's just so thick. Is it going to even resolve uh, or partially resolve the mucosal formation? There has been a very small handful where there's like technically just three dogs, two were with hypothyroid and one was a Shetland sheep dog. And, but none of them had a long-term follow-up, you know? So I just feel like those are kind of tricky because I don't know if later on they, they have this problem. And, and uh, But this dog, when I see hypothyroid, I do think um, that treating that is uh, not unreasonable. You really should anyway. But I would not judge, uh, I, would, I would not encourage owners to say, oh, you just need thyroid medication, you're going to resolve your gallbladder mucosal. You have these older dogs that are coming to you, and a lot of times people get scared of surgery, especially when animals, uh, when you stumble on these in particular. Then you usually talk to the history, like, yes, it's been episodic vomiting and such. Then I do say, well, if you need time to think about it, let's, what can we do in the meantime? You know, and I, and I always tell them it is a ticking time bomb. It's gonna happen, just more when. So I do do a fat-restricted diet, uh, the real canin, GI low fat, Hills low fat ID. Uh, ursodial, and that's always interesting, like, you know, when do you do ursodial? You know, because technically it's contraindicated when it's obstructed. So I have to have a really normal bilirubin, and you're hoping that the common bile duct is still patent then, but it's still a little gamble, because I'm like, one day you're going to pass a little hard sludge right through your common bile duct, and then boom, and you're on ursodial, and, and it stimulates contraction. Am I going to increase the risk of rupture? I think it's a rupture no matter what, even with or without ursodial. So personally, I think if you are... Um, the owner says, I'm just not going to go. Uh, maybe it'll help protect the liver a little bit, but there is a little gamble to that. Um, and definitely will be contraindicated if you do have really high bilirubin. Uh, Denimerin, and that's really safe and easy, anti-oxidant, um, uh, and remember it's on an empty stomach for maximum absorption. I do think that the biliary stasis is going to irritate the liver, so it's something good for the liver. Be careful about sometimes mixing certain drugs, you know, with uh, Denimerin. You have to really treat the underlying disease minimally, 
hypothyroid and Cushing's. Which, by the way, if you notice the endocrinopathy thing, there's no diabetes. They did have a higher rate of um, gallbladder mucociles with diabetes. I thought that was interesting. Antibiotics, you know, we definitely know that biliary stasis can predispose to secondary enteric infections because it is coming from the GI tract going to the liver. Now, I was telling owner, you know, liver is a filter organ for your, your bowels. We typically treat at least four to six weeks. It's almost like deep tissue infection, uh, just like, the, like polynephritis, uh, deep um, bladder wall infections. So you're going to treat much longer than just two weeks. And then maybe even longer, six to eight weeks, but we just really don't know. When you look at culture results, it really varies. You know, it's a pretty big range. 2.7 to all the way up to 67% are positive. So if you put all the studies together, and the most recent one, it's like a pretty 190 some cases, it was like uh, 14%. So ultimately, um, there's a variety of bacteria. It could be more than one uh, group of bacteria. I have to keep that in mind that anytime there's stasis, yes, you can get uh, infection. So how do we choose our antibiotic? I do think it's really important to kind of think about what you're treating. I do think sometimes that we tend to pull something but not really thinking about the spectrum it's really picking because you just think that disease is this. And uh, remember the ampicillin, amoxicillin family, um, you're going to get your anaerobes and then you do get some of the gram negative aerobes too. So I, I really like amoxicillin. It's pretty relatively cheap. Um, especially um, if you write an outside script, if owners just can't afford it, I, I, I've done that. And I, in public, it used to be free for a two-week supply. The main thing is, um, you, I think it's a pretty broad spectrum, and, but then it really is not getting uh, great uh, anaerobes at all. Uh, well, I take it back. It does, ampicillin moxicillin gets anaerobes, but sometimes I want something more of a stronger gram negative, and that's where I often will use enrofloxacin. And a lot of times you're choosing antibiotics also by, based on distribution. It's not just in a plate, what is it going to be sensitive to? Because that's when you get cultures, it's all not really in the animal. So there's some major breakdown how much fat is in that tissue when you're trying to penetrate. And um, enrofloxacin in particular, compared to even ciprofloxacin, very hydrophilic, um, like it likes uh, fatty stuff. And um, so I do find that that has a really good distribution um, in the gallbladder system, in the biliary system, so I'm a big fan of enrofloxacin for that purpose. But we are seeing more and more resistance, so still use caution. And I do think um, if I have a milder case, I might start with just amoxicillin. And we, in our hospital, we do IV um, ampicillin with sobactam, so it's kind of like IV clavamox. It just potentiates the ampicillin. And then anaerobes. Um, I, I do think metronidazole is great, but if you notice that it's just not going to get in your gram negatives. And most of the, the, a lot of the GI bugs to me, I think it's E. coli family, you know, Proteus, you know, all that kind of stuff that it can be enterobacter. And the treatment of gallbladder mucosal, really the main thing is surgery, um, and that's something that uh, doctor, I'm going to probably pass it on to Dr. Roach. And I do think that um, gallbladder, you know, in, in all gallbladder patients, uh, mucosal patients, uh, it's diseased. And so you have to be careful because they will eventually rupture. And so a lot of times you will see rupture or necrosis. And of course, this is a population bias a little bit when you look at these studies. But you, we, we really focus on the low mortality risk when patient's not clinical. You know, so this is a time. That's why this dog today, Ladybug, um, had surgery. You know, and because she's just even she's 14. You know, age is not a disease, and we always say, hey, your dog is healthy. Otherwise, why not? And um, and then uh, in the long term is really great. But again, depends on the surgeon too, I guess. But uh, if you had me to it, it'd be very bad. So monitoring. So we do often will um, obviously have the immediate uh, evaluation. But a lot of times they, they can have the first two, three weeks. You know, again, Dr. Roach will kind of go over that more. But, but I know that as an internist, they often will say, all right, I, I did this. Dog's doing great. I'm sitting at home. Where do they follow up? You know, aside from suture removal, from my perspective, I kind of want to know, was the liver enzymes high before? Is there, you know, 50% of them can have primary liver disease? Sometimes we'll get that histopath back, like, ooh, there's also, you know, cholangiohepatitis hepatitis on top. And sometimes they're very straightforward that there is just purely from the gallbladder mucosal. So uh, we typically monitor that in two to four weeks uh, um, uh, until we see it normalized. And it does take time. Sometimes it takes up to three months sometimes. I, I do think the uh, follow-up <coughs> ultrasounds could be helpful, but I don't know. I mean, have you removed it and there's nothing else exciting? 
it, it has been suggested, but uh, I'm going to be honest, we don't always do that unless the animal's not doing well. Any questions on medical aspect? So on, the, on this dog today, is that normal literal inside value? Mm-hmm. Would you um, do less to the liver biopsy? No, I would still always get a liver biopsy. Because I hate you like, oh, it's going up, you know. And I, I personally would like to have a liver biopsy, but that's, that's an internist speaking, you know. Because you have that one time at the buffet table, like, that's how I picture when you guys do surgery. And I would want a little bit of everything that I can, and then you guys suture up, and I'm like, oh, you didn't get that. And, um, but I realize, and it depends on, on risk, you know. Um, and that's something that the surgeon, you know, would probably have to kind of guide me, like, oh, we can't biopsy the colon. You know, like sometimes when we want GI disease, it's, oh, yeah, just take the colon and do this and that. And I feel like it's like a this dim sum or sushi checklist, and I could just, like, order what I want. And I realize it's totally not. So I do, um, I think the liver is still important to me because, you know, you can have really bad liver damage, but it's not really always obvious because uh, there's so many liver lobes. You know, so that's where I feel like it's, it's a little bit, I'm hoping by visualization that you guys will often guide me to, you know, like, oh, this looks kind of funky because we have normal liver enzymes, but your liver looks a little bit, you know, blotchy. Um, but if it's not too big of a deal, I like liver biopsies. Everyone. Yes. Do you take intestinal biopsies today? Or do you over like, do you think all the clinical signs are related to I, This was so impressive. And again, this is one of those things that, you know, do you collect what you can? And, and you also think about anesthesia time. Is it worth, you know, every single time to do that? I think that's probably where uh, it's a discussion where if I have any kind of chronic uh, issue that's pretty severe, I, I, I may say, hey, can you do that for me at the same time? But I, I could really imagine it could be normal, you know. This one was just so classic. So there have been uh, two reported in the cat, and it must be something funky, you know, because you, you, like the rare, rare Cushing's cat, for example, you know, that you may like hear about or you pull the skin off, that kind of stuff. So I, it's definitely not, I have never seen one, but I was trying to research that too, and um, the cat is just pretty rare. So. so I'll probably pass it on to Dr. Roach. The second part of this talk is going to focus mainly on the surgical aspect of gallbladder mucosils. Uh, it's a very common um, these are very common cases that we see here, uh, mainly through the emergency service. Um, and the, kind of the goal of this talk is hopefully just get more information on um, mucosils and hopefully get them maybe sent over for surgery a little bit earlier. That's going to be kind of the theme here is just try to operate these cases a little earlier w would help us out. So an overview of this part, uh, we're going to start out with the anatomy of the gallbladder, the common bile duct, the little papillas. Um, We'll talk about there's there's kind of three or four different surgeries that you can do on the on the gallbladder, the biliary system. We're just going to kind of give a brief overview of those. If anybody has any questions they want to get in more detail, happy to talk to you either during this or afterwards. Um, and then we're going to uh, go through some of the perioperative management and monitoring uh, that goes along with gallbladder mucosal. These are not your uh, ACL tear where you just you know, to do the surgery and kind of not think about them until the next day. These are something you got to keep an eye on, make sure they're not having complications. And then the last thing is the timing of surgery. Like I was saying before, um, I'm a little biased being a surgeon and having to operate these cases, but um, just in general, the, the earlier the better, but also there's some times when we don't operate them. And so just trying to give you more information on, on kind of our thought process I think will be helpful. So we'll start out with a little anatomy. The things that I think are important to know are the, the gallbladder itself, uh, the common bile duct, and the papillas. Um, so what we're looking at here is obviously a drawing, but this is a liver lobe. The gallbladder itself is generally shaped like a, like a pear, um, if you will. It has a little, it kind of tapers down to a neck into what's called the cystic duct. That connects the gallbladder to basically the common bile duct. The common bile duct goes from the hepatic ducts, which are these little branches off each liver lobe. And then this main tube that goes down to the intestines is the common bile duct. As far as a, when I think about biliary surgery, it, to me it's more like plumbing. The bile, which is made in the liver, has to get into the intestines somehow. And so ideally it just uses the normal anatomy. It comes through the hepatic ducts, through the common bile duct, into the intestines. But if that's not possible, something's wrong, we can manipulate the plumbing there. We can just make sure there is a tube taking the bile from the liver to the intestines. That's kind of the overall theme when you're talking about biliary surgery. 
It doesn't matter if you're a dog or if you're a person. If the bile can't get into the intestines, you're not going to survive. So this is a little bit different drawing just to kind of show a little bit further distal. Um, once again, we have the gallbladder. Um, it tapers down to the cystic duct, and then it joins up. This is, I would consider this still a common bile duct. All the hepatic ducts are dumping into it. And dogs have different anatomy. Sometimes there's a lot of branches coming in up here, sometimes even coming on the gallbladder. Just be aware where the gallbladder stops and where the hepatic ducts start to come in, and then be aware of the common bile duct and where it enters the intestine. If you're going to do surgery on the biliary system, you just need to know a couple of these points. The anatomy is really important. Um, the common bile duct will enter the intestines, usually in the proximal duodenum. So what I typically do is just follow the common bile duct down to where you just can't see it anymore. Um, on the dog today, the dog had no fat on it. It was super easy to see this, this green or blue common bile duct going all the way to the intestines. And then there's an intramural portion of the common bile duct, and it's usually depending on the size of the dog, a centimeter or two, maybe a little bit more. And then it, it dumps into this little, uh, or, or enters the intestines at this, what's called a major duodenal papilla. It's like a little nipple on the inside of the intestines. And so when you're doing some of these procedures, like you're trying to flush it, you need to know where that is. You don't want to make this five inch incision in the intestines trying to find this little teeny opening. And so we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about flushing the, the common bile duct. But just the anatomy is really important. The pancreas, which lives right here between the stomach and the intestines, um, has little ducts. Some of them do enter alongside the common bile duct. Um, that's more common in cats than in dogs. So when they have concurrent pancreatitis, a lot of times they'll have blockage of the biliary system. In dogs, generally the, uh, the pancreatic ducts enter at this little minor duodenal papilla down here, just a little further distal down the duodenum. So now we'll just kind of go through, just like I said, a brief overview of kind of the three most common surgeries, three or four most common surgeries we do in the biliary system. Uh, by far, the most common thing that we do is remove the gallbladder, called a cholecystectomy. Uh, the indications for a cholecystectomy would be the gallbladder is the source of the problem. Does that make sense? So a mucosil would be an example of that. Um, Coleolis, so you get um, stones in the gallbladder. Uh, cholecystitis, infection of the gallbladder, or inflammation of the gallbladder. And so the idea here is you can solve the problem by removing the gallbladder. You can only remove the gallbladder if the common bile duct is patent, if it's working. You gotta have one or the other. You gotta have the bile getting from the liver into the intestines somehow. So if that common bile duct is, you're not sure if it's working or not, you can't take the gallbladder out yet. You gotta make sure it's patent first. Um, we'll go through the dissection and the ligation uh, of how to take out the gallbladder here on the next couple slides. But I put laparoscopic up here. That's something that's been out I don't know, the past five to ten years, there's kind of these individual case reports. And I was just at a um, laparoscopic meeting last summer, and there's a lot of people that are starting to do it. So I think in the next five or ten years, there'll be a lot more folks doing it. Um, the keys with doing it laparoscopically, it has to be an early case. Um, no common bile duct obstruction, no adhesions, no leakage, um, which unfortunately is, that is not the cases that we normally see. So we don't get the opportunity to, to do it laparoscopically yet, but maybe in the future we see those earlier cases, we can start doing that. But tonight we're just going to talk about doing the open procedure. Uh, Kelly touched on this a little bit, the last thing here, the lab submissions. We generally culture the, the liver and the gallbladder together. We put them in the same little culturette, and then we usually biopsy the liver. As far as the gallbladder, when it's a mucosil, we actually have an example over here from today's dog. Um, you can tell it's a mucosal. You don't really need to spend the owner's, in general, need to spend the owner's money on, on getting a confirmation that it's a mucosal from the lab. So this is just a, a picture intra-op. Uh, the dog's head's up top. The xiphoid would be right here. Uh, these are the balfours. Cranial is the top. These are the sides. Caudally is the bottom. This is the gallbladder. This is the lobe of the liver. Looks like a lobe of the liver. And then you get the pancreas coming in here, so the duodenum will be pretty close. And what we're looking at here is this gallbladder does not look healthy. It looks enlarged compared to the size of the dog. It's kind of got this white, greenish, kind of opaque look to it. And so overall, the idea is we're gonna, this is we're approaching this, um, this abdomen with the idea of removing this gallbladder. How do we do that? The first thing I do, other than try to remember to do a full exploratory, is I try to improve my exposure. So we use Balfour's. Um, we'll have an assistant a lot of times use the spoon from the Balfour to kind of hold the xiphoid cranially. 
Well, I think a good little tip is to take, I usually take a four by four, depending on the size of the dog, I take a four by four and stuff it between, stuff it gently between the diaphragm and the liver on the right side, and the same thing on the left side. And what that does is it just pushes the liver and the gallbladder caudally. It just brings it back just about an inch. But sometimes that can make all the difference as far as your exposure. Um, we did that just a couple hours ago. I think it worked out quite nicely. So for the, the di dissection part of it, the cholecystectomy part, um, I'm just going to use this diagram to kind of show you what, what we're doing. This would be the fundus of the liver, or the fossa of the liver. The gall so this is the gallbladder sitting between the quadrate lobe of the liver and the right medial lobe. And then it narrows down to the cystic duct. Once again, you have the hepatic ducts into the common bile duct, and you would enter the intestines over here. <clears throat> so the goal here when we're taking the gallbladder out is to peel it out of this, the fossa, out between these the liver lobes, which are usually attached. Um, there's usually some intimate attachments around the edge of it. And so what we do, you want to start, it, start to try to get an edge there. There's several different ways to do it. Um, my preference is to take some cautery, like bipolar cautery specifically, and just try to just get an edge going. Just give me enough to where I can get my finger in there. Um, and a lot of this is just finger dissection. What you're trying to do is try to peel it out of here. And I used to take like two hours plus to try to peel out a gallbladder until somebody showed me you can just use the finger dissection technique. If you just gently stay right up on the gallbladder and just kind of, it's, when it's, especially when it's mucus sealed, it's a really firm thing. You just kind of peel around it um, as long as you're staying up near the top here. When you're dissecting further towards the cystic duct, you'll be a little more careful. The vessels are a little bit bigger. Um, I might get some bleeding there. But you can get usually the majority of the gallbladder dissected pretty quick by just taking your finger. Um, you can also use the inside um, of, a, of a pool tip suction. Just take, take the little outer, outer part off and use the inside. Some people use Q-tips. There's a lot of different ways. I found the finger dissection thing to be pretty successful. Depending on the stage that it's in, um, like today, it was pretty straightforward. There was no adhesions, no sign of rupture. Sometimes you open the abdomen and everything in there is stuck to the gallbladder. It takes you an hour just to find the gallbladder. Those are not fun, but it's, once you get down to the gallbladder, it's the same principles. You still have to dissect it out of, the, out of this fossa here. So the second part, and in my mind, kind of the critical part, this, this is where you just kind of slow it down a little bit. This is where you can make mistakes. This is where you can have some big complications if you're not careful. And so once you've peeled, so once the orange again, this is the liver, this is the faucet that the gallbladder was in. We've peeled that out, and now we're down to the cystic duct, or like the neck of the gallbladder, where it tapers down is where you want to ligate it. There's several different ways to do it. I generally take a right angle forcep and just clamp gently below the mucus seal part or below the big part of the gallbladder. In this picture, they're showing ligating the vessel separately. You can do that. That is definitely not necessary. I think everybody here never ever been around. They just ligate it all at once. Um, as far as ligating it, it's usually just an encircling ligature. You can do one or two. Uh, my preference is to do a single modified Miller suture. I just think it's really strong and, and it holds. You can also use hemoclips or ligaclips if that's easier for you. Is there only one vessel, or is it varies in animals, like that vessel that... There's usually one main vessel that goes with the gallbladder, but sometimes, depending on how chronic it is, or adhesion, sometimes they'll have vessels that attach up here in the fossa that are pretty intimately associated with the gallbladder. And so that's when you're doing the finger dissection, you just be gentle with it. And usually, if you run into that vessel, you can kind of feel, okay, that's not, that's not dissecting very easy. And so you just kind of peel around to that area, and then you can just cauterize it, or ligate it, and then just, just keep moving on. So sometimes you do get abnormal vessels, but the straightforward ones just, you basically just peel it out of there and you just take it off at the base. Can you leave too much of the base if you don't get far enough distal? So that, that is unknown. As somebody who stares at these a lot, I'm like, I don't know the answer to that. It seems like you want to get all of this gallbladder tissue out of there. Yeah. Um, my understanding of how these things form is it, like the mucus seals, they form from the tissue in the gallbladder. And then all that abnormal tissue, if it builds up, some of it can flow down into the common bile duct and obstruct. And so if you leave some of that, so say you took it off right here, I feel like it'd form a little mucus seal right there, potentially. So my goal is always to get it down past the, kind of this, the big part of the gallbladder. You don't want to take it here. And sometimes that's challenging to see. And so that's where I just, you just slow it down. Um, this is where you really need to just be sure of what you're doing. And if you're not sure, then air on the side of, I'm going to take it up closer to the gallbladder. 
You know, the worst case there is they have another mucosil. I'm not sure that's ever been reported. But if you take it down here, I can promise you, you're going to know about it real quick. In the 24 hours, I'm not going to do very well. Does that make sense? So it's really, you're just dissecting it out of this little fossa, and then you're just ligating at the base. It's, it's actually it can be pretty routine. How, how a variable for dog to dog in, like how the distance that you have to go from the neck all the way down to the next, you know, uh, hepatic uh, duct that's going in, like can it be vary from like two centimeters to like five, you know, what's the... I think it does vary. And that's why I'm just real careful. Once I get down to where I'm thinking we're near the neck, I just, just take it really slow. Also look at it from different angles. I'm left-handed, so I'm looking at it usually from this side. And so I just try to look around and just make sure I'm not missing something. Like today I had um, Dr. Ike handling it. I'm just trying to move it around a little bit. Just make sure I'm not missing one of these ducts coming in. I don't want to ligate the hepatic duct from one of the liver lobes if we don't have to. I would say the hardest ones in my mind to remove are the ones where the mucosil goes all the way down to here. It just seems like there's no neck to it. It's just like there's no neck. It's just the head right down to the shoulders, if you will. And you're like, okay, how are we going to ligate that? In extreme cases, you can also, if you're having trouble with it, if the, if the mucosil is not like jello, sometimes you can just, if this thing is huge and you can't even see behind, you can't see down to the bottom of it, you can make an incision. I've done it a couple of times, make an incision to the top and just put the suction here and just try to work that stuff out and then you can just follow it down. Once you get that jello out of there, it collapses down. Then you can find that neck and take it off. Overall, you don't, if you can help or if you can prevent the mucosil, the, this biliary stuff from from coming out to the abdomen, you should try to prevent the contamination. This stuff can be kind of caustic, and it varies from looking like jello um, to looking like a can of snuff or dip uh, to like little little chiclets of things. And when they rupture, they can just go all over the place. Um, so just just take your time, be careful. If you have a hepatic duct that's dumping directly into it, you just ligate it. So if, they, if they're going into the gallbladder, I do. And I, I, I imagine that there is a second duct coming in somewhere lower. Um, but, but yeah, if you're taking the gallbladder and it's coming in here, you, you got to ligate it. What the concern is is that if you just kind of peel this thing out of here and miss that duct, then you, then you close that abdomen up and it's going to be leaking bile out of that liver, and that's going to be a problem. So try to catch it as you, during your dissection, feel those things. And a lot of what we're talking about right here is not in any book. I mean, there's just not a lot of discussion on this. This is cutting-edge stuff right here. <laughs> like Dr. Wong was saying earlier, mucus is kind of come in all different kind of shapes and, and flavors and all, all this stuff. Um, this is kind of the classic. It just looks like this like black jello kind of stuff. These are actually great because it's, it's kind of tough to spill these. They're just so solidified when you cut them open. But they can also be like this where you get these things that just fall out or almost like a little finer material, and they can certainly cause contamination. But there's just a lot of variety here. Like this one has all these strings and stuff. I imagine on the ultrasound it looks like the little stellate mm -hmm. things. So the, the second procedure, so the cholecystectomy is by far the, the most common thing that we do um, with gallbladders. A, a side note of that, um, a lot of cases that come in that are obstructed or they've already ruptured, we need to make sure that that, that common bile duct is patent. And so this is where we hold off on taking the gallbladder out until we know that the common bile duct will work. If we take out the gallbladder and the common bile duct doesn't work, then that's a dead dog. I mean, that's just how it is. And so we want to kind of figure that out on the front end. We don't take the gallbladder out until we know that we got a way for the bile to get to the intestines. And so the way I was trained, that every time we took the gallbladder out, we would make an incision in the intestines and pass a catheter up the common bile duct, flush it, make sure it was patent. We would close that, and then we take the gallbladder out. And I've done that a zillion times. And it was just part of my routine. And then recently, um, talking with other surgeons, probably the past five years, and then the past couple of years going to some soft tissue meetings, um, the vast majority of surgeons no longer flush the common bile duct unless it is obviously obstructed. And you can look at it and see if it's just like full of stuff or they have an elevated like total bilirubin indicating that there's some obstruction. Um, and the reason for that is um, it's not the hardest thing to do in the world, but you do, in, you do introduce a risk when you do the flushing because you're going to open up the intestines. It's not sterile. You get an incision now. It's got to heal. When you're flushing that, that bile, the idea is, we'll get into it in a second, but you're flushing in there hoping everything's going to come back out 
the duct, but it's possible you're flushing stuff in and it's getting impacted into the liver and you're causing more cholestasis. It's just, just unknown. So it's not a benign procedure, and so a lot of folks are no longer doing it. Um, I would say I've done a few where I haven't flushed the common bollock. The one, one today was one of those. Um, and so it's just a total 180 for me. It's a much easier surgery. Um, but uh, I just want to kind of throw it out there. Like, this is a very common thing that's done, and it is indicated when there's an obstruction, which is the majority of the cases that come in on emergency when they're not doing well. you, you got to make sure it's paid. So can you just kind of like squish on it and see if it's, I mean, is it by a tactile feel that you're saying you know, that that's, you know, readily collapses or I can feel material go through, or how do you determine it? So yeah, usually it's distended. I will I will touch it. Now the the common bile duct is something you definitely do not want to mess up and be rough with. But you can usually feel it, and I feel it all the way down to the duodenum, and see if you can feel like something that may be obstructing the papilla as well through the intestinal wall, um, and that kind of helps me make the decision there. Um, I do a lot also on how the dog is doing clinically. Are they yellow? Are they you know have a, have a high total bilirubin? If they are, I'm more likely to get, I'm going to flush it. Um, but if they, like today, the total billy room was normal multiple times on blow work since November, um, the duct looked like I could see stuff moving back and forth in it. So we just didn't mess with it. I'll let you know a couple of days if that was the right decision. <laughs> but it seems like that's going to go well. But when you do sometimes see that in between, right, that liquid, I mean, I've seen when um, they're, they're doing the squeezing, you'll see like it will be like liquid and then a little chunk come out, you know, on those in between ones. And they're, they're so rewarding because you're like, you know, and you just you see these little like gel like particles that come out. Um. I totally agree. So for me, it was very rewarding to do that. Um, you get these little chunks out, you're like, oh, I just saved this dog's life. And that may not actually be true. You know, we just don't, we don't know that. Um, they were doing, if they were doing fine before, there was bile flowing, the total ability room is normal. Maybe that's not necessary. That's the whole thing. Like, I, it's just a bit of a change in, in direction with our thought process. That show up okay. So once again, if you get in the abdomen, this is the, it looks like a edge of the bowel four and bowel four. The head is going to be up here. Uh, I got liver. This is the fossa here. You got the gallbladder. This looks like the common bile duct coming down to the duodenum. And you can even see a little bulge of green here. This common bile duct looks really distended to me. So if you see this situation, you're going in after a gallbladder mucus heal, which is usually diagnosed on ultrasound. So you're thinking this is not normal, but this isn't normal either. I can't explain the common bile duct obstruction with just the gallbladder being the problem, right? This would look normal if the gallbladder was the only problem. And so in this scenario, you kn I'm going to make a little incision over the duodenum or over the papilla, and I'm going to pass a little catheter up here, and I'm going to flush it and make sure I can get that flowing before we commit to taking out the gallbladder. I'm going to, before I'm going to feel comfortable taking out this gallbladder, I want this to look better than this. I want this green thing to go away. I feel like that's going to be a chunk of bile, probably from this mucus seal that's come down the common bile and got lodged at the papilla. So we're just going to make sure this thing flows. In this case, I think it's worth the risk. So you're sense. making your incision where? So it's a, it's a, an incision in the duodenum. You try to do it right over where you think the papilla is going to be. Okay. And a lot of times it's a bit of a guess. Usually what I try to do is find the, the pylorus. And I'm following that duodenal curve down, and I'm kind of making it meet where the common bile duct, where it kind of disappears, using that fat around the pancreas. Um, and so, if, a lot of times you don't get to see this. this is, to me, I would cut right, I would cut on this side of that, but right over it. But if you don't know where it is, you just try to think there's probably going to be a couple centimeters of intramural bile duct, common bile duct, and then it's going to have the papilla. So just making an incision, over, like an educated guess there. And I usually start pretty small, you know, a centimeter or two and just take a little peek and then extend it one way or the other. The last thing you want to do, like I said, is to make a big old duodenotomy, do a perfect surgery everywhere else, and then this thing's going to leak afterwards because it's got an inflamed abdomen, he's feeling sick, and now you have a septic abdomen from something that, that you've kind of created. That's always a concern I have. I try to make it incision as small as I can. Do you have to worry about the minor papilla, or wherever the, bile, or the pancreas empties into? So usually it's not going to be obstructed okay. from this. Where you can run into it, though, is say, you're like, I think it's going to be here. I'm going to make my incision, and you see the little papilla, and it's actually the minor. You start trying to jab the catheter up in that, and it doesn't go. And you realize 10 minutes later, actually, I'm too distal. I'm at the minor. Now I've got to find the major. I imagine you just obstructed some of the pancreatic flow. So just be careful where you're at. You try to find the major one. It's the first one coming down um, the duodenum from the, from the pylorus. In really severe pancreatitis cases, do you find, because on ultrasound, the duodenum looks sometimes really, 
irregular, thick, corrugated? Do you see that physically on surgery too, on some of those bad you know, uh, duodenitis cases that have concurrent pancreatitis? I, th I think there's a lot of dogs that have inflammatory bowel disease mm -hmm. along with these like gallbladder biliary things. And so with those, when we do make a, so this is, if we're going to flush the common bile duct, we're going to make an incision in the duodenum. And so as we're closing, usually we'll just take a sliver, full thickness sliver of the duodenum as we're closing just to get some biopsies to try to diagnose if they have inflammatory bowel disease, what, what's going on. But I do think it's a pretty common in these little, these little small old dogs. They've got more than one problem usually. I definitely have some concerns with some of the, the closures of the duodenum. Like, I'm not sure this intestine is super healthy. And so that's why it's nice to maybe you don't have to do this in every dog because you do introduce risk. You know, now you have an, an incision. Now I'm not going to sleep for the next three or four days while this thing tries to seal over, and is it going to work? So you can. Um, what, we, what we typically do is it's pretty far up there, and a lot of dogs, it's, it's the ORAD part of it, so closer to the pylorus, it's pretty deep under the ribs sometimes. So what we'll do is we'll place a, usually a stay suture kind of mid-duodenum. We'll have someone retract or just keep it on a heavy instrument where you can kind of pull it back, kind of pull everything out from under the ribs. That'll give you a handle and then have, have suction there, kind of making sure the stuff doesn't leak out in the abdomen. And of course, pack it off. In these cases, sometimes this isn't the quickest thing. You're going to be doing this for 10, 15 minutes. And so I just usually have lap pads all over the place that's just catching all the stuff, all the leakage. Because you got not just bile coming out, but you got stuff from the stomach when it decides to empty, stuff like that. What type of catheter are you using? It depends on the size of the dog. Usually it's about a five French red rubber, is what I use. Um, and some of the small ones you can use a three and a half French. Um, on when it's really tight, sometimes I'll use a Tomcat catheter. Um, but most dogs you can pass a five French up there. For closure of the duodenum, depending on once again the size of the dog, I usually use 4O PDS on a taper. And I do simple interrupted closure and we try to leak test it afterwards. Some people use 3O PDS. Yeah. So, you know, those red rubbers are like very small. So yep. Did you cut them? And now you've got just a, or do you use the blunt end? Yeah, I wish I had a picture of this. I usually use the, I mean, the, you the use blunt the end. that comes out of the package and just content with it being this long? I do. And it, it curls around. We usually have somebody scrubbed in with us. And so usually one person is, us, is holding back and having the suction. Um, and then the other person is usually has a, um, a forcep right here to keep it from sliding back. And the other hand's on the this, on this syringe. And you're just kind of flushing, then you refill it and flush. And just kind of keep you on that till you feel confident that it's so when you're, it's unstuck. When you're, when you're flushing, it's going up to a non. Uh, I mean, you can't put anything more in that gallbladder, presumably, right? Yep. So if you're flushing two cc's, where's it going? So or usually five or ten or whatever you're doing, where's it going? So usually it just comes right back out. Okay. Yeah. So and, you're just trying to chisel away. You're just trying to. I'm just I'm really just making sure that it is patent. I think the occasional case you're really having to work it to get stuff out. Um, a lot of times I just want to make sure that I just didn't. Sometimes it's tough to catheterize them, and I'm like, man, did I just pass that out into the abdomen? And so I just put my finger up on the common bile duct and just make sure I can feel the catheter in the common bile duct. And you can also kind of guide it up here to these other ducts. I, I know some surgeons that are pretty aggressive about making sure you get every single duct. I think that's pretty old school. That's that's 10, 15 years ago kind of thing. Um, and once again, the whole idea is you just need to make sure that bile can make it from the liver into the intestines. It's the whole point of this. Um, I have, since the past couple years, I'm just much less aggressive about making sure every little chunk gets out. You know, just want to make sure it's patent. Are there a certain distance you're trying to pass it up? I mean, do you want to pass it up to the level of the cystic duct? You, and so, that's, a, that's a great question. I think it's actually challenging to pass a catheter up into the gallbladder. Because if you look at the anatomy, it actually has a pretty significant bend right here. And so usually when you pass a catheter, it's going into one of the hepatic ducts. It's going into the, the liver lobe stuff. I usually pass it up gently until it stops. And then I just back it out and flush. I kind of just work it around a little bit. And you have the gallbladder clamped when you're doing this? Sometimes. No? Sometimes. This is definitely this is just a drawing showing the cholecystectomy. Uh, but usually not. Like I'm just trying to make sure it's working. Occasionally, if I'm not sure, I'll squeeze on the gallbladder a little bit just to make sure stuff's coming out. But overall, I think that's kind of not the, not the greatest idea. You want to introduce more stuff. Right. But the whole idea is you have to have a patent tube to get the bile out. Common bile has to work before you take the gallbladder out. If there's a problem like a rupture or a mass that's in the common bile duct that's not associated with the duodenum or the liver, you can resect that part of the 
common bile duct, you know, if it's just kind of out here like this, that would be ideal if it was cancer because you could potentially get it all. Where I tend to see it is up here at the papilla. Like there's a big old mass at the pancreatic level, um, and that's something you're not going to be able to get a resection on. And so what you're doing there is either one, you're like, this is a mass, let's get a biopsy of it. But what we tend to do is try to bypass the common bile duct. That's why we're waiting to see, make sure this is, is patent, because if you just go in there and just take the gallbladder out and then you start assessing this and you find a mass here, that's a dead dog, right? If he's, if he's obstructed here and you've already taken the gallbladder out, where that gallbladder helps you is you can take the gallbladder and attach it to the intestines. It's actually not that challenging of a surgery. And what that does is just let, you can just bypass the common bile duct. All the bile which come out of the liver, it'll find an obstruction here, so it'll just work its way back up and then it'll dump into the intestines. I'm actually going to skip ahead to that since we're talking about it. It's called a cholecystoduodenostomy. That's a ridiculously long name. I think it makes people kind of shy away from the procedure just because of the name. Um, basically, you're just attaching the gallbladder to the intestines. And we're talking about intestines, it's going to be that proximal duodenum because that's really all you can reach with a gallbladder. You're just going to just fold it down on there. But the indications for that is when you have a common bile duct obstruction or the common bile duct is ruptured, it's not healthy, and you're going to have to ligate it. And so there... If that dog's going to survive, your option is to attach the gallbladder to the intestines. Anybody done this before? I'm going to try to, I'll just try to walk you through a little bit. What you're going to do is you're going to attach the gallbladder to the, to the duodenum, that proximal duodenum. And a lot of times you've already tried to pass a catheter up the common bile duct. That's when you figure out you got a problem. This thing is obstructed. I can't do it. So your duodenum is already opened. You just use that same incision. Um, you try to make it at least two and a half centimeters in diameter as far as that, that permanent stoma that you're going to form. And you can just fold that gallbladder down, and you're going to make a two-layer closure. And so what you can do is start on the far side, the, the side closest to the liver. That's kind of the blind side. And you can go ahead and just shoot your two layers, and then you can make your incision in the gallbladder that matches your incision in the duodenum. And then you can, oh, this is what's happening here, and then you start coming around that near side that you can see from the from the front and just do a two-layer closure. So you do just a 360? Yeah, I, I usually don't go all the way around with it with a continuous. I always just stop at the ends. I'll do 180 degrees with a continuous. But you want to do a two-layer closure if you can. Sometimes these are really teeny dogs or a cat. But the idea here is this is typically, I know we're talking about mucus seals, but this is typically not with the mucus seal. What's happening here when you're doing this, there is like a mass on the papilla or the, com the common bile duct, and you're just having to reroute it. In this case, the gallbladder is huge because it's so distended. It's backing the bile is backing up into the gallbladder. It's getting hugely distended. The biliary ducts. So it's going to look like this. You can go in there and you're like, oh, everything's really backed up here. Um, if this is the liver and that's the gallbladder, all the all the hepatic ducts and the common bile duct is really distended because there's probably a mass down here. And so what you do when you attach that gallbladder to the duodenum, what you'll find is that's that dog probably has a really high total bilirubin. And the next day you check, it's probably going to be in half or less. Because all that bile is going to say, oh, thank you. I can just flow out into the intestines now. Like I said, it's a little bit different. This really isn't with the mucus seals. Because the mucus seal, your gallbladder is also not going to be, not going to be healthy. If your common bile duct is, is obstructed due to mucus seal stuff, you can almost always flush it out. You can get it working. Is that confusing? This is always the big question for, for us. When to cut these dogs? how to manage these cases when they come into your hospital. So when to cut, I think there's one that's pretty easy, and that's when they have bile peritonitis. It's already ruptured, it's leaking. That's a pretty obvious choice. Either they're going to go to surgery or they're going to be euthanized. There's not really a good medical management for, for this. And so how do you diagnose bile peritonitis? Kelly talked about it earlier. Um, if they have fluid in their abdomen, you can compare the bilirubin concentration of the fluid with the serum. If it's greater in the fluid, that's consistent with a, a bile peritonitis. You can also do cytology. I don't know. If, I've never looked at bile pigments in my life, but apparently you can. Kelly also talked about this. When you have a, a gallbladder that's ruptured due to a mucus seal, you may not have fluid in the abdomen because that, as that gel stuff is not going to really just flow out. And it's really kind of already plugged off the common bile duct, so you're not going to get backflow from the liver out that gallbladder. And so sometimes it can be confusing to, to know when that occurs. Is it already ruptured? Is it not? Um, in a couple slides, we'll show you that the ultrasound is really not that sensitive for picking up gallbladder ruptures. But overall, if you're looking for something, you're like, should we cut this or not? And there is fluid that's consistent with um, a bile peritonitis. That is a reason to cut. And sometimes, like on ultrasound, the ones that rupture, you'll literally see this, like, 
the shell or the, the gallbladder mucus seal itself, it's, you know, there's, the, there's no gallbladder wall to it. It's just like it's kind of plopped out and it's just like in the abdomen. You'll be like, just literally when they open it up, it's just like a little kiwi there. So it's weird. So the, the bigger question is when to operate specifically gallbladder, gallbladder mucus seals. Patient comes in, has some nonspecific clinical signs. They get worked up, have an ultrasound, and you diagnose some mucus seal. The question is, what do you do with that? Do they go right to surgery that day? Typically not. Typically they're going to be, well, let's, let's get on some medications. Let's get back in for a recheck in a couple months or a few months. Let's check some blood work. But from a surgical standpoint, I would say, looking at some studies, there's been no proven correlation between the ultrasound pattern um, of gallbladder mucus seals in the patient's clinical disease or if they're ruptured. Um, there is a paper out there, like Kelly was saying, a lot of them have different scales, like one to four, stuff like that. There's one that's one to six, um, with one being kind of the mildest, not a lot of formation, and six is like a very mature mucus seal. But there's a study out there that shows that a lot of the ones, in, at least in that particular study, um, that were ruptured were actually stage two. And so there's not this logical progression through the, oh, we're only at stage three, we will recheck in six months and it might be stage four and we'll just kind of follow this. It really is kind of a ticking time bomb. Like we just don't know how these things progress. We don't know when it's going to rupture. Um, and I find that pretty scary from a surgery standpoint. I often find from a medical standpoint, it's like the pancreatitis. That's where once it kind of blocks the pancreas, it's so swollen too, and then the gallbladder was already partial, then it's like, boom, you know, what made it? So those are, I do see maybe why those cases that have associated with pancreatitis, because you know that mucus seal has been sitting there at least for several months, that something had changed. The, uh, the report of sensitivity, I did notice that Kelly picked the highest percentage. <laughs> it was, that was from a 2004 study from Dr. Pikey. That's old. That's actually a surgeon's study. Um, but the, the more recent ones, the 2017, 2016, the JVIM, I think that's for internal medicine. 55% uh, chance of, or sensitivity for ultrasound picking up gallbladder rupture, um, and the 75% in the 2016 study. And the whole point of that is, you can talk about percentages all day, but really we're talking about this specific dog. Can you tell on this dog that that's ruptured or not, and the sensitivity is just not great? And so there's going to be some unknown there, some judgment you're going to have to make. Uh, medical management, Kelly already kind of shredded that, that study. It's, um, there's a 2008 study looking at two dogs that have mucus seals that resolve with medical management. Um, it's really like, a, these are case reports. One of the dogs was lost to follow-up after three months. It's just like a really tough report to really base your, your treatment recommendations on. You can definitely medically manage them. There's a lot, of, a lot of different reasons why you may do that. Maybe finances for the owner, maybe the situation they're going through. But in general, when you have a gallbladder mucus seal, from a surgical standpoint, I would say the owners at least need to hear that surgery is recommended. We don't know if this thing's going to rupture and when, and so you at least need to hear about surgery. So we're going to talk about when to cut. We talk about when we're not going to cut or when we don't recommend it. One of them is gallbladder sludge. There is some evidence that this is part of the continuum with the, the mucus seals. But there's not enough evidence to say if you have sludge, you should... You should to remove the gallbladder, the benefit has not been shown to be worth the risk with that. So that's a wait and see. If the patient has concurrent disease, that may be the source of the clinical signs. Kelly touched on this. This is a very common thing. You talk about pancreatitis. Um, it can be pretty challenging to, to know what is the cause of the signs. Is it pancreatitis? Is it this gallbladder mucosal? But if we are convinced that it's, this is just a kind of an incidental finding with the mucosal, then it makes sense to let's sit on this mucosal, let's medically manage this other disease process and they come back when they're feeling better. It's been shown that dogs that have hypotension or increased lactate will have a much poorer prognosis with surgery. So we want them to be as healthy as possible going into it. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if you have a dog that's super sick, very yellow, the total bilirubin's in the teens, this is like the worst, dog, worst case ever for surgery. That's a lot of cases that we see here. If they're, they're really unstable and there's evidence that there's an obstruction, like so the total bilirubin's really high, is what you can do is actually delay surgery because you know their prognosis is not great with surgery. You can place a temporary, it's a col what's called a cholecystostomy tube. And what that does is just you're placing a, a, a catheter through the body wall into the gallbladder, and that allows you just to drain that backflow of bile that's being obstructed probably in the common bile duct. lets you just pull it off. And so you're emptying the bile for them. Rather than going into the intestines, it's just coming out into your, your catheter. And what you do is just maintain that for a few days. That gets their total bilirubin down. They start feeling better, and then you can operate them at that time. 
Anybody ever seen that before? We did a few of those at Georgia when I was training there, and it was pretty amazing. You actually feed the bile back to them through like an NG tube. It worked quite well. You can either put it in with ultrasound, um, or you can even do like a real quick laparoscopic procedure and kind of visualize that catheter going in, into, the, uh, into the gallbladder. What you use is a, uh, a pigtail catheter. Uh, this thing has a, a stylet. When you put the stylet in, the catheter is straight. Um, so once you punch it into the gallbladder, you remove the stylet, and the end curls around like a little pigtail, and that keeps it in the gallbladder. This is the picture of the other end of the catheter. It's coming out the body wall, usually the right side. Sometimes you have to go between the ribs. Like a on it? It just, just hooks into like a bag. You could, um, but really just kind of aspirating off of it intermittently. And so this can really save you in those cases that are doing terrible. You just know that dog is not going to do well under anesthesia. Um, this is this is at least an option. Do you do suture anything at all? It's literally just a catheter that pops in and there's nothing. So what you do, uh, usually the gallbladder is pretty close to the body wall. You'll finger, purse string it, finger trap it to the skin on the outside. Um, if you're going to medically manage these, to so say it's a pancreatitis case and they're backed up, um, you want to leave this in for, even though it may get better pretty quick, you want to leave it in for a couple weeks, let a fibrous adhesion form between the body wall and the gallbladder, and then you can just remove this, this thing and it will, the hole will close on its own. Do you have to kind of uh, tug it? So like, I'm thinking like a peg tube, you know, how like sometimes we have... You don't have, have to. You don't have to it kind will of form seal. A little, there's a study on that. There, it'll form a little adhesive thing all the way up to it. Mm -hmm. You just leave it in for two weeks and it, it will be fine. And does it matter the consistency of the bile, like echogenicity of the bile? Like, is it if it's super liquidy versus? So with a mucus seal, this probably isn't going to work well because yeah. it's it's pretty it's jello. Where this comes in is when there's a common bile duct obstruction. Everything's backing up into the gallbladder, backing up to the liver. This is where that's helpful. But usually, what we're doing is when we did this, we would go in surgically and remove the gallbladder later, remove something, and we would just take this out. This is a bit of an extreme thing, but it's an option because as a surgeon, you're like. Please send this case over earlier. Let's make this as easy as possible. And then, of course, it shows up at 2 in the morning, and it's ruptured, and it's like, this is going to go terrible. This is a way to kind of get out of that situation and just you know, trying to get them feeling better again uh, prior to surgery. So periop management, like I was saying before, this is not like an ACL surgery where you just get them onto pain beds and just check, them on, check on them in the morning. You definitely want to monitor these guys. They can do poorly, uh, one, during the, during the procedure, during anesthesia. Uh, they can also do poorly afterwards. So you just need to keep a close eye on them. For the dogs that aren't feeling well, maybe concurrent pancreatitis, we put a, usually put an NG tube in these guys. It allows us to decompress the stomach. Uh, it also allows us to feed them early. And then anytime you have an intestinal incision and you're worried about it, if you have an NG tube in, you can just put some contrast down there in a couple of days and take some x-rays and just make sure there's no leakage from your, your enterotomy. I find that very helpful. It helps me sleep at night. Survival rates when you're talking to owners. But six studies out there that I found. The most recent one is 2009. These are all retrospective studies. So these are not great studies to be basing your treatments on, but these are numbers that are out there. It's also important to know that all of these studies, it's, they're talking about gallbladder surgery, but they group more, they group pretty much every gallbladder disease into these studies. It's not just mucus seals. Um, so you get like necrotizing, cholecystitis, trauma, cancer. Uh, and mucus seals kind of grouped in the, into these things. It's important to know that. Um, the most recent one, 2009, had the highest survival rate of 86%. And these are typically survival rates for the first two weeks out from surgery. Once they get out past you know, two weeks, they usually can, if they survive that, they're going to survive this. Um, it's just kind of that first few days, a couple weeks after surgery when there's a risk. Dr. Wong and myself here had a nice debate about this ourselves. And so I just I don't know what questions you all have. I know you've asked a lot along the way, but if you have questions about you know, when to refer and do you want to refer them to the internal medicine service or do you refer them to the surgery service, we can, we can try to hash that out here and try to help that make sense for you. Um, also put up some costs. I don't know if those are correct for medicine, they seem. I hope they're right. Just try to give you an idea. Like surgery, when we did today, we gave him an estimate of $2,400 to $2,800. That's certainly not inexpensive. That's a big deal. Um, we get that, but we also need to let you know, like, if they come in on emergency, those can be here for several days, and it could totally be, or easily be more than this. I'm usually pretty conservative with my estimates. Um, it can be pretty expensive. It can be a big deal. So we're talking about sending them over early. It can be a very routine surgery. That surgery took less than an hour, and that dog's hopefully going to go home the next day or two versus emergency. So the overall theme here for me is 
if you see mucosil, please talk to them about surgery. Try to send it over as early as possible. Just client education, I think, is a big part of this. Let them know like they can do very well um, if you catch it early and it's routine. That is all that I have. Thanks for sticking around.